All right, everybody, thanks for joining us for our uh, uh, Elk Management Unit reorganization uh, public meeting that we're having. Uh, my name is Luke Maduna. I am the Big Game Program Manager uh, for the Nebraska Game and Parks. Um, for those of you not familiar with Zoom, a um, couple little tips here over in that lower left-hand corner is the mute and video buttons. Um, for the most part, you can stay. Um, we'll, we'll try to keep everybody muted, and uh, you can keep your video off. It helps with your, your bandwidth and, and everything. Um, if if you need to, we'll talk about it a little later on, uh, get through here. Um, most of it, what we'll do, we found works really well. Uh, questions and comments to go through the chat um, has worked really well for us. Um, if you need to, if something just, it, it's hard to put into words, or maybe I don't understand what you're, the, the comment or the, the question that you're trying to ask, uh, you can turn your video on and ask a question. Sometimes that's easier. Um, the chat is over in that little corner. You can type in there and um, and just hit enter. And make sure it's to the to everyone um, so that we can we can read it. Um, and if you need to change your toggle view, if it's focused on just one thing, or you know, when we get later on, um, you can adjust that up there. Um, our our meeting format here. We'll have a, a pretty quick slideshow. I'm going to go through some of the history of of our elk units in the past, and then what our proposal is and um, what are the what the um, intended outcomes and and all that are? Um, we'll have a time for question and comments. Um, the one big you know basic rule for it all is just be respectful. I'll you know I'll sit here and answer questions um, as long as people need tonight. Um, we just just got to be respectful and we'll work together on this. Um, again, the chat it works really well um, to submit your questions and comments. The other thing that it does by putting it in the chat it'll um, record, record it there, um, and everybody will be uh, saved. It'll all be saved in our meeting notes, which will all go to um, all of our staff, um, uh, commissioners, and, and administration will all get to see it. So that it also helps us uh, record the information that goes on um, here. So um, with that said, we'll jump into it. You can see this is our current unit boundaries. Um, pretty expansive. We make it's got it so basically the western two-thirds of the state are all within a uh, elk management unit um and so that's where we're at right now this was our uh, map for the 2022 season um you can look at our history um from when our seasons our, our modern season started in 1995 with hatton bordeaux um we added the board bordeaux uh, the boyd unit in 1996 um that was a cooperative uh hunt with south dakota um between boyd it, County, Nebraska, and, and Gregory County, South Dakota. Um, and then in 2003, uh, we added the Box Elder. And you can see most of those original units, you know, the Hat Creek, Bordeaux, and Box Elder were all pretty pretty narrowly defined around the areas where we had elk at the time. Um, they weren't very expansive. Um, as time went on, we added the Ash Creek unit in 04. The North Platte River unit was added in 06. Um, in 2007, we added the Nyabrera. Um, and that was a pretty expansive unit. We also expanded the uh, uh, Niobrara, or the, sorry, the Bordeaux uh, east over to Gordon. Um, so we encompassed a lot more um, ground over there uh, to the east um, up in the Pine Ridge. Um, in 2008, we expanded the Box Elder um, to account for uh, elk expanding outside the, the Les Canyons, um, south of North Platte. Um, and so that was one of our first kind of big steps in expanding, a, you know, creating a, a rather large unit. Um, in, in there and then in 09 um, all the panhandle units were expanded to fill in those gaps so there weren't any uh, gaps you know in between units uh, where elk weren't uh, able, able to be harvested or weren't um, in a legal unit. In 2013 that reciprocal agreement with South Dakota um, uh, was terminated um, and then in 2019 we split the Niobrara unit um, and the Boyd was absorbed into Niobrara East. Um, and then in 2021, the Box Elder unit was expanded east to account for elk in the Republican River Valley, um, in the Les Cain, or the Les Hills, you know, Custer County kind of area, um, east of, of 183, which was the, the, the previous boundary. You can see that um, where that was, and we expanded east all the way over to, um, what is that, 281. Um, you know, at that point, you, the box elder unit, I think, is about 26 at, at this point right now is about 26,000 square miles. So it, it accounts for about a third of the state um, in a single unit. So um, kind of our, our purpose for this is to help give us a little more flexibility or ability to manage our elk. Um, you can see how our, our elk harvest over the um, previous three years 
how that lines up with um, where our, you know, the primary elk range where we've got most of our elk use um, in and around those areas in that elk habitat. Um, you can see there's not a lot of harvest uh, outside of those, uh, those core areas. Um, this map gets a little busier, but you can see this has got the proposed boundaries, or at least our initial um, rendition of those proposed boundaries. Um, the, what we're looking at doing is dividing the entire state into 14 units. Um, over the past, or the previous three years, about 6% of our harvest is occurring outside those historic units. So still a large majority of our harvest is, um, is occurring in, in these, the, the, those historic units, you know, those, the, darn that moved, these, you know, these units up in the Pine Ridge, um, you know, the one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, we still have like 94% of our harvest uh, occurring in those areas. Um, so one thing it would do, it would narrow our primary units down, um, but it would allow us to provide ample um, permits in those secondary units to manage the expansion of elk herds in undesirable areas. Um, one of the things we've found and the purpose for all of this is that um, it's hard to push hunters into those, you know, in our previous or in our current um, format, it's hard to push hunters into some of these peripheral areas. Um, if you can see my mouse, um, it, it, it's just hard to push them into those areas. They'd rather hunt elk where there's lots and lots of elk in that traditional habitat. Um, but we do need um, increased harvest in a lot of these peripheral areas, which are, are often agricultural, you know, row crop areas. Um, so that's one of our, our intents here is to, to set up units that have their own, um, permit quotas, um, and, you know, ready and willing hunters that are, are ready to go in those areas. So, um, overall our, our permits and the quotas would operate under the current format. It would still be a drawing. There would be quotas, you know, both bull and cow, uh, permit quotas for, for each unit. Um, the one thing that we haven't, uh, necessarily, um, decided on is whether or not we're going to, uh, you know, stick with, you know, names that we've had historic, you know, local names that we've used, or if we just switch to numbers. Um, I think there, we, staff were kind of leaning towards numbers. It would simplify things for us. Um, so, but that's part of the input that we're, we're taking too. Um, the other thing that we're, that, that's different, the, the one difference in the, the permits and quotas is our approach to unit 14. Um, what we're looking at is on this uh, eastern side um, is not necessarily having a uh, limited quota um, where we would sell and issue permits for that unit 14, um, but rather we would make it so all of the permits for units 1 through 13 would also be valid in 14, um, since a fair portion of our um, hunters are uh, from the eastern part of the state. That way, um, you know, if they ha happen to catch a, you know, a neighbor or somebody they know that's got an elk on them at that time, or, um, you know, then they would be able to go chase that elk there. Um, part of it is that we, there's not a lot of elk in the eastern part of the state, and they tend to be very transient. They don't necessarily um, set up, and th there's a few places where they've, you know, obviously they, they stick more than, um, they're, they're not entirely transient, but they, you know, they, they, there's a few places I, I should say where they've set up some home ranges, but it's not real common. Um, and so without established um, elk herds there, we, we, it, we wouldn't necessarily feel that it'd be fair to sell somebody an elk permit when we couldn't necessarily um, direct them to a specific area or a landowner uh, that may, may, have, may not have elk. Um, so that would be kind of the one thing that we're wanting to address, but we also wanna make um, the entire state open to uh, elk harvest. Um, and allow those elk that are wandering across the eastern part of the state to be to be utilized um, rather than uh, you know put down if they end up causing troubles because that's uh, that's currently our only option. Um, so our goals, I probably stepped into this um, a little bit, but we want to provide permits and our focus our effort um, in those secondary elk areas to better manage populations in those areas. Um, essentially, it'll force hunter redistributions to those um, areas that need it. Um, you know, we're increasingly Box Butte County. Um, you know, the area where we had our special depredation season this last year, um, those types of areas, uh, this would help us to um, force and put pressure there instead of trying to coax hunters from the particular, like, for example, in that box elder um, unit, people really like to hunt, you know, in the canyons there, and it's really hard to get 
uh, per persuade people that have a permit um, to hunt there to go chase them in cornfields over to the, the west, south of Ogallala, um, for example. Uh, so it would also give us uh, the potential to put more pressure um, in those areas of, of crop damage um, and again, better distribution of the permits to deal with those problem areas. Um, and like I mentioned before, it allow harvest statewide um, and allow hunters to utilize those wandering elk um, instead of just re simply removing them uh, if and when they cause trouble. Um, some of the potential side effects, uh, you know, in some of those peripheral areas, we could expect lower success rates and uh, possible bull quality metrics in some units. We would analyze that um, and evaluate that on a unit by unit basis um, based upon, you know, our, our goals for each of those units. Um, which essentially comes down to social tolerances if, you know, if we want to have higher quality bulls or if landowners want higher quality bulls in some of those areas, we would um, address that. But if we, if we're in areas where we typically want fewer elk, we're going to have um, lower bull quality metrics uh, by and large. Um, and with the, the, some of those areas, they're going to be tougher hunts. Um, so success rates are expected to be a little bit lower uh, in that regard. Um, it could uh, potentially redistribute some of the draw odds. Um, some of these new units uh, would likely provide better odds of drawing, um, but lower success. You know, I mean, some of these, you know, a fair number of people aren't going to know where to start. Um, and if, if you don't have contacts or, you know, have a place to start in some of these units, you should probably, you know, be, be applying in, in the historic units and not just throwing a dart, um, you know, like into unit, you know, the proposed unit 13 or something like that. Um, you know, so that if there's somebody with inside knowledge on some of that, pretty good chance you're going to have a um, better draw odds in some of those units. Um, with our overall um, proposed permit numbers are kind of where we're looking at it, at least to start with. I don't foresee a major reduction or a huge shift from those traditional units uh, of permits to the these new units, at least on the, the, the bull side, because most of our bull harvest is already occurring in all the, those traditional areas. Um, so most of the permits in the these peripheral units or these new units would be additional. Um, there could be some fluctuation with the cow permits, but probably not a ton initially. Um, we're still in a phase where we need to increase our cow harvest. We need to have higher cow harvest than what we've had. Um, you know, one of the potential side effects is, you know, those lost hunters. I kind of alluded to that. If somebody draws a permit with no clue to start. Um, and some of those units that could be a, a, a side effect, um, but staff is already dealing with a fair amount of that in all of our uh, units as it is. We work with a lot of our hunters to, to line up access and, um, and uh, work with landowners to get hunters and, and all that. Um, so the, the reorganization of units will also separate some of the peripheral landowner zone from those core landowner zones. Um, as we've had elk expanding, you know, outside of those traditional areas, um, we've added uh, landowner zones uh, popping up here and there. We've got some starting out in the sand hills, um, and actually some in you know the unit 13 away from the Niagara East areas, as well as um, even in Keith County. Um, so we're we're having some of that pop up. Those landowners would actually be separated from um, those core zones, so their permits would be valid for that area where they're they actually own their land, um, but for for that entire unit. Um, and there would be some potential here to reduce the need for the, the special depredation seasons. Um, it would fill in some of those gaps um, and allow us to, to manage the number of permits and you know, direct harvest pressure um, in those areas where we need it. So um, yeah, those are some of the, the potential side effects um, from it. Um, overall, yeah, we've been trying to get a, a bunch of public input on this. Um, yeah, please take a look at the maps on the website. Um, on that, it's our elk plan page um, on our website. Uh, most of you, are, I assume everybody here found saw that link, found that, um, and have seen those maps. Um, you can provide input through the form. I've got between 100 and 110 comments um, so far through there, uh, mostly supportive. Um, of these changes. Um, the timeline for all of this, uh, we'll take comments through the website um, through January 30th. Um, we'll review those comments. Obviously, if you, we'll, we'll continue to take comments through this all the way through the, um, the approval phase, if that's the direction we decide to go. But we'll um, work with landowners in these potential problem areas, um, some of these areas where we know that, you know, we want to make sure that we get some of these boundaries um, correct or areas where we've had issues with um, elk issues and depredation um, issues. We'll, we've got staff talking to a number of landowners. 
um, on, on some of this. Uh, we'll take all that input. Um, we'll discuss it internally and with our commission um, and our administration and decide whether or not this is something we want to um, pursue. And then uh, if, if we do decide to pursue it, it would uh, take place at our um, changes to our big game orders at the April commission meeting. Um, and with that, uh, we can take questions and comments and I will get out of this and we'll get back to the uh, normal Zoom page, but looks like there's one chat that popped up. Uh, Chris has got a question. Will current bonus points be changed for all applicants? Yep, these the, the, the application process, none of that's gonna change. Um, and the, the bonus points are actually, they're species specific, they're not unit specific. So um, there's none of that that'll change the, the same process. Um, we'll go through the drawing and all that. So that'll remain unchanged. Um, Kevin, uh, any chance of making unit 14 over the counter tag for any hunter that happens to have a rogue bull show up um, out of the blue, et cetera? Uh, we, we discussed that. Um, and it's a possibility, like I said, we haven't decided on how exactly we want to do it. Um, our fear, worry is that we could potentially put hunters in an awkward um, situation, um, particularly with, with the price of our permits. Not everybody's going to want to spend um, the money to have that, that permit sitting in their pocket. Um, your odds of seeing a bull once or seeing a bull twice you know you might see him once and it's tempting to shoot him and then go buy a permit we don't want to put our hunters in that situation any more than they might already be um you know so that that's one of our worries and like i mentioned um a little earlier we, we without you know large established herds in in, in those areas um we, we yeah we i don't know that we necessarily want to sell permits just to let um yeah, I guess some of the over-the-counter stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's something we can definitely consider, and we'll we'll continue to dis discuss. But yeah, um, it's a possibility. Um, Ethan, what are the odds of changing areas eight to fourteen to open it up for bull harvest to people who have already filled a once-in-a-lifetime bull tag? I would say right now, I, you know, I've had a number of those uh, comments. Right now, we we had. 4,998 applicants for 128 bull permits. Our demand for bull permits in the state is is immense. I mean, we had 35 applicants for every bull permit this past year. Um, I I don't know that those 5,000 people would be very happy if we uh, they you know if we let second timers start drawing um, permits again when um, a large majority of our hunters haven't even drawn our, their first first bull permit. Um, if we end up in situ, you know, obviously, or that that would be our approach to start with. If we ended up in a in a situation where we're having difficulty um, selling some of these, you know, uh, permits in some of these peripheral units, um, we'd probably look at you know changing things up to make sure that we can um, have hunters available in a lot of those areas. Um, but right now, I think our intent is just to keep it, you know, everything kind of status quo. We're just changing unit boundaries. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, I, like I said, you know, if, if things, you know, if there's un unforeseen issues or things aren't, don't work quite as planned and we need, need to change things up. I mean, there's, there's that possibility. I think some of that once in a lifetime stuff though is in statute. So it'd be a, um, that's a, that would be a big thing to change. And I don't think right now that there's any, um, any intent to change that. So Jonathan says, uh, given the potential side effects described, would the commission please consider the once in a lifetime harvest of both non-landowner residents? Um, I do support statewide harvest opportunity and the intent to utilize hunters to manage birds. Um, oh, so Jonathan, are, are you kind of asking the same question there? Yes, yeah, sorry, Luke. I actually was in the middle of typing that question when that first question came in. It's just it's okay. about once in a lifetime harvest for uh, you know for non non landowning residents. Um, I, I know two units I'm, I'm going to keep applying for, but perhaps you know we, we might you know apply elsewhere if if, if it wasn't that uh, you know just once in a lifetime. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I can see the the hard thing is we we've got so many people that are still waiting for their first permit that it's. 
that would be a tough thing to do. And again, I think I'm I'm pretty sure Alicia, you might have to remind me that's in statute, right? So that would be a yeah, that would be a statute change. Yeah. So uh Bryant, do you foresee elk populations in the non-traditional units expanding or are these changes to or a tool to keep elk from expanding anywhere or any more than they already have? Yes, exactly. That's our big thing here is we, we we've kind of reached a saturation point where um we really can't have elk uh there, there's not a lot of room for elk to expand in the state um they've pretty well uh expanded to all um suitable elk habitat where they'll be tolerated um you know i, I always the, the thing we found is that you know by and large you know everybody in the state has been fairly happy to see three and five elk come over the hill um it's exciting um, it's when it turns to 15 and 20 that they start to wonder, and when it turns to 50, um, it they they tend to call us and and uh, ask for things to be fixed. So um, we, yeah, you know, all the the areas with you know your your typical elk habitat, you know, topography and timber, um, you know, outside of the the less hills in central Nebraska, um, there's really not a lot of habitat left, and and where you know that type of habitat um is uh interspersed with row crop ag um it's just it, it's we, we found that there it's a it's a recipe for disaster um to let herds get too big in some of those areas so this is a this is a tool to help us push hunters into those areas to help control um and manage our elk number. i shouldn't say control it appropriately manage our elk numbers um in each of the different parts of the state um, is a better way to frame it because as time goes on, we may find that there's more support for elk in some of these areas than we initially realize. Um, and as that goes on and as that progresses, we'll we'll adjust. Um, but yeah, we've got to we've got to address the social tolerances for elk. Um, we know that's a a fine line to walk uh, everywhere across the state. Um, let's see. Uh, Clint, uh, any chance to with early season tags? uh year to year very different i didn't feel my cows they didn't show up in that area until late sorry i think you've got a word missing there clint you want to chime in and i guess our, our early season tags have been a, a a helpful tool for us to to put pressure in that early season particular when they're um in a lot of those crop fields so that's been a big tool for us to to try to keep oh to do away with no, I think really the those those early season splitting early and late um, has been a really big tool to help us increase our harvest because um, what it does is it forces hunters to use their time um, or, or their time when they have access for. We've had uh, had places where you know somebody gives somebody access until they um, fill will you know they keep telling people no 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 that they can't go in until you know Joe gets in there and takes his um takes his elk and when you give people a shorter season um they they tend to get out there and, and use that time um and it, it moves more hunters through and has increased our harvest um so it's been it's been a helpful tool um in that regard rather than having a full you know generally hunters are going to use you know six or ten days whether or not they've got two months or six months to go hunt so this helps us um cycle more hunters through and and hopefully have higher success um let's see you oh man we've had a few comments there it kicked up on me so john would you be willing to consider issuing more cow tags to our youth or if a uh, cold depredation is needed um channel more of them to the youth to help them get more involved in nebraska hunting um we really don't have a mechanism for i mean we you know youth can apply for all these permits you know when we had our depredation season those were open to i mean youth could um, apply or do that. One thing we found um, in deer is that youth aren't always a great, we can't always rely on youth to uh, handle our depredation um, hunts. We want, you know, a little more experienced hunters, um, things like that. We, yeah, we really don't have a mechanism in our permitting system or our, our regulate, I should say our regulatory system to, to dedicate those permits to, to youth. Um, and there's, I guess the, the other side of it too, is there's so many other species um, that we can uh, utilize or, you know, use to encourage 
um, youth to hunt rather than one of the most highly sought after ones in the state. Um, you know, whether it's small game or yeah, John. So I guess that, that to explain that question a little bit further, um, and it's, it's just a little bit of my own frustration, but I've, I've been putting in, um, my nephew for several years for a cow tag, um, for the box elder unit. And he hasn't been able to draw, which I, I get the drawing system and everything, but then in that same unit, we turn around and issue deprivation tags when he got, reje when he gets rejected year after year for a cow tag. So I guess that's where that question is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, you know, the, the, the special depredation season, we want to, that, that's a tool to make sure that we can use hunters um, as the solution for helping remove um, or issuing uh, more permits in a specific area. Um, you know, and as I'm just trying to think of how to um, explain it, but uh yeah, and I, the yeah, I guess I'm I'm kind of in that same boat. I've never drawn an elk permit. I've put in you know ten or eleven years in a row now. Um, you know, and some of those units are a little higher. That box elder has always been a higher uh, a higher demand or lower draw odds um, unit there. So, but you know that was a, a particular area. Um, you know, in that. Uh, Keith County, where we needed to, uh, we were working with our landowners to try to increase harvest in there. But, um, Craig, uh, what percentage of the elk increased over the state on a year over year basis? We, we actually don't have a, um, an exact count of elk. Um, we've done some modeling. Um, it, population estimates of elk are a rather difficult um, you'd think for such a, a, a large animal that they're easy to easy to find on the landscape, but they can use uh, topography and and uh, um, vegetation cover uh, pretty uh, quite well to hide. Um, we've done flights trying to count them um, and have had poor success. Um, and with the the relatively low numbers or low densities of elk that we have spread over. Um, large areas, the traditional methods that the Western states use um, just don't work well enough or they would be exceptionally uh, expensive to, to operate. Um, so generally we, we try to uh, work with our, our, our landowners and operate kind of off with a, a, a social tolerance, um, you know, letting the landowners tell us if they want, you know, more or fewer or stay the same uh, kind of stuff like that. So, um, Right now, I think we I'd have to look at what our, uh, we've worked with staff and talked to landowners and just trying to figure out exactly how many elk we've got on the landscape. Um, right now we, or our, I should say our peak that, you know, after calving this last summer, um, I think our estimate was 26 or 2,700 elk statewide. Um, you know, with the harvest, I, we've taken somewhere to 350 or, or, or so, so it'd be somewhat less than that and some natural mortality, so probably uh, 2,200 or 2,300. So right reduce now. the wait time for a cow permit. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. How about if you reduce the wait time for a cow permit? Um, yeah, I guess the, that's something we could look at. We still have, you know, right now this past year, we don't have any shortage of, of applicants for cow permits. We still had about 2000 applicants for the, the 500 cow permits, give or take that we had, or 400 and some. Um, so the odds of drawn one overall were about one in five, um, which is down from what it's been historically um, with our increased um, permits that we've issued. But yeah, we still, um, yeah, again, we, we still don't, we don't have a shortage of people putting in for them um, in that regard. Then uh, the problem is access. Yeah, then it always will be in a private land state, access will always be a, be an issue. And that's one of the things that, that we face trying to get harvest. Um, but yeah, hunters gotta, we gotta work with landowners and, and all that, but it's, you know, access in Nebraska is, is really no different than a private land hunt in Colorado. Um, you know, access on, on private land will always be an issue. And, um, 
you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally understandable too. We can't mandate access or, or any of that. Have you ever thought about block management? Um, we, we do some of that with our open fields and waters. Yeah. We, we've, uh, considered some of that. Um, and it just, it, it operates a little differently, um, in it, but again, you know, you, you, we, we've asked, I mean, in all of our, uh, places where we have depredation issues, we offer and, and discuss OFW with them. Um, but by and large, they, they really aren't, um, there, there's not a lot of desire to participate. Most people, most landowners want to know exactly who's on their land. Um, and so again, it, it, it's back to square one. They, they, the, those landowners want to have um, that control and you know, that's every, their every right to do so um, to, to know who's there. Luke, um, would and I appreciate you uh, letting us get on the call today. Sure. But, um, you know, when you're talking about landowner access, um, the increase of the landowners getting seventy five percent of the total permits, isn't that creating more issues for the resident uh, people that are trying to uh, obtain access for one? And also draw permits for two. Um, some so the, I, I guess to to clarify the um, the landowner allocation is seventy five percent of what the general allocation is. So for instance, if uh, general hunters get hundred permits, the landowner uh, quota is seventy five. Um, set would be seventy five permits. Um, previously, it was fifty. You know so. Previously, they were getting 50 of the 150 total permits, now, which is a third. Um, they're getting it, it moved up to 75%. So 75 of the 175 um, permits, which is 43%. So it's a, it was a modest um, increase. Um, what we found as, over time is that uh, the elk have, have thrived on the, um, in Nebraska on that chance for landowners to hunt elk. Um, and have that opportunity to hunt elk. Without those landowner permits, um, our elk wouldn't be uh, nearly what they are at this point. Um, that's helped generate a lot of support for elk in the state. Um, and yeah, you know, increasing those landowner um, permits, you know, you know, there's there's some potential there for you know just you know having more friends and family um, hunting there and, and creating some access issues. But we're also getting to a point where we're starting to lose support for elk. Um, because landowners were having more difficulty um, in drawing permits. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's kind of a trade-off there, so. So who would have, so I know this was a legislative, uh, legislative uh, change. So who, you know, and, and, you know, just sort of like also, you know, landowners being able to hunt earlier now in deer season. So who is, driving uh, these initiatives um alicia you might have to remind but that was mostly you know essentially us working with landowners in the legislature on that part yeah that's 75 percent was something yeah. the commission was very behind yeah so yeah i mean that's you know it's it's just trying to address you know concerns from all angles on, on that one but you know by and large like i said you know elk the support for elk has has rested you know heavily on the backs of those landowner permits and their ability to get permits and um you know just the as those landowner pools have gotten bigger you know it went from landowners drawing a permit every you know three or four years to now um eight to ten years in some of those units and so some of that was just to uh uh reduce that wait time for landowners so, um, Luke, you might want to touch on the the uh, earned landowner elk permit as a way to get more access too. Yep, that's that, something that also was passed at that same time. Yep, as a part of that same thing, we also um, there's an earned landowner uh, permit where if they allow uh, ten general antlerless harvests um, on their land, then they can get a a free any elk permit that's valid on their ground. Um, and we had. Um, Pretty good participation in that um, last year, and it did generate a, a lot of um, a lot of a lot of access for our, our 
our general hunters. Um, we had a couple of them that were actually turning away um, other landowners within their unit to to get general hunters on. Um, so it, it 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 that that permit um, did help out there. So, but that that was also in that that same regard. We were, we were finding that um, we were we were beginning to lose the support or support for elk from those landowners that the elk spend a majority of their time on. And so that was a permit to try to um, try to get some of that support back because they, you know, by and large, they want to have elk there so they can hunt them. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand that. Um, I, I guess, you know, like you said, you were, you know, sent in for 10 or 11 years now. And I know that I've probably been sending in uh, almost since it's, it's opened and I think that's 20, 30 some years. Um, and, you know, we all know that, you know, now I think there's a total of nine points um, um, or bonus opportunities. Have you ever looked into changing that um, to give the people that's been sending in and have the higher point uh, points a better percentage chance to uh, draw a permit? And I know yeah. this is, sort of looking at my myself but I was thinking you know I mean why not it, it, it appears to me when I was looking at the drawings that you know even if you have zero or one or two permit or two points or whatever they I mean they have an equal chance and there's just about as many permits being drawn there as the people that have uh the max points yeah um hang on one second uh yeah and i can uh, it won't help you because you're actually on your phone but it'll help everybody else here to see some of this i i've got you on my screen too okay cool um but yeah i guess to to start out with we we simply don't have the elk population um in the state to support and guarantee that everybody's going to get a permit um like i said this last year we had you know 35 applicants for every bull permit um you know, and so if if we would move to something like a preference point system, um, it would be, you know, potentially upwards of, you know, 30 to 35 years, as long as everything stayed the same, if, you know, applicants increased, um, it would, you know, make it even longer. And generally in a, a true preference system, um, once people get to about 20, they don't like preference systems anymore. They would much rather have a chance. Um, so I've done some analysis on our our drawings the last several years. Um, the those in the the highest point pools are drawing at a, a much higher rate um, the, than those in the you know the, the the bonus point system where you have your name you know if you had eight points your name was in the hat nine times. Um, those people had a much higher chance of of drawing. I mean they drew at a six you know six percent of the people in the eight point pool. Drew, whereas 0.6% of the people in the zero point pool drew. The issue becomes there's only 350 people in that eight point pool, whereas there's 1,085 in the zero point pool this last year. So there's always going to be a handful. I mean, we had eight people draw with zero points this past year out of over a thousand, but we had 21 draw out of um, out of the 350. Um, so they are drawing at a, at a much higher rate than those um, those people who are just starting out. The, the problem, if we would go to a preference point system, um, you know, essentially this past year, it would take, I mean, if, if these point pools all stayed the same, um, it would take about three years to get through pool eight, you know, two and a half years to get through seven. It, if, if I did the math on this the other night, it would take about 15 years to get through the first four, four point pools. Um, by that point, point four would have 19 points. Um, and you would have a whole spread going down. You know, if you weren't in in your first in the first few you know pools, you know everybody that's in the high point pools wants to go to a preference because it guarantees that they um, would get something. Um, but it's everybody else starting out. I mean, a, a kid just starting out now who's you know twelve or sixteen or just starting to um, apply, I, he'd be he'd be sixty by the time he drew. And every it, by that yeah, point. I would Go ahead. I wasn't really, I mean, I understand the preference point system and I, I know that would be bad for everybody, but how about setting it up like a percentage of the draw? Let's say 
uh, I'm just giving you an example, and I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but like from zero to two point gets gets 25% of draw. The the people from three to five percent gets a 35% of draw, and then and then you know the and and plus the 25% previous, and then the people from six to eight gets you know a 45% draw, and then plus the 35 and the and that and that so they're in all the pools of the draw while you you sector it into you know different pools i guess yeah i don't know if you understand that or not no i do south dakota south dakota has historically done something very similar to that um this last year they actually and it was a true well it was a considered a preference point system where yeah the top i can't remember what it was like the top two point pools got you know the first drawing for so many points like kind of like you described um, they actually just switched over to a bonus point system, but instead of just working straight bonus points, they did a bonus squared. So like those in the eight point pool would have 64 plus one, you know, it'd be an N squared plus one um, number of names in the hat. There's a whole, every, every, <laughs> there's a whole host of ways to do it. Every state across the West does it different. Some is it, I, I'm trying to remember, I think Nevada cubes your bonus point numbers. So you get to a certain point. Um, you know, your odds get a lot, a lot better when you've got you 10, it ends up, you, you've got a thousand names in the hat, you know, so every, there's, there's a million ways to skin that cat um, and do it, you know, which everybody, you know, it, it, it just depends on, you know, how much we value um, earlier applicants getting a chance to get it um, versus, you know, the people who put in the longest. Um, and right now this does a pretty good job of, of getting, you um, everybody a chance you, you know um of getting a permit but yeah there's there's a whole host of, of of different ideas and different ways to do it for sure well i i guess what and i've been reading and, and looking at some stuff and i won't take any more of your time but you know looking at changes and i i know that that's what you're doing so you know looking at old school versus new school i'd rather go new school but you know me you know just thinking out of the out of the realm of things um yeah might improve things. yeah yeah oh and and that's something um that's something we're always looking at is different ways to try to solve some of our problems for sure so thank you yep for sure thanks thanks for the questions and comments um, luke you were on clint goldens early is great but wouldn't it be better to have the permit season wide on the okay. chat yeah all right, thanks for keeping me on on track there. Um, yeah, and you know we we've kind of r- run into some of those um some of those issues where it 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 actually has worked. We we've actually increased our harvest, um, and in some regards our our, our success has uh, actually gone up when we split um, our early and late um, because it forces those hunters to cycle through. Um, more and in, in 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 turn, it's actually increased access um, for our hunters, um, just because people can't lock down a, a whole area for for the entire uh, for the entire season. Um, Ronald asks, when will we find out about application to the add land into the zone? Um, that actually gets approved at our April um, commission meeting, um, and our our guys are working on that right now. So if if you're in an area, um, talk to one of your local biologists um and uh and they can work you through the criteria we've got a list of criteria um to get added to the zone but um that stuff all you yeah just be in touch with your local local staff um and then that'll get that gets approved at the april commission meeting along with all the all of our orders setting our our seasons for the next year um patty's asking uh are the parameters if you're a landowner who qualifies for landowner tag if so how oh are are there parameters uh yeah we've got parameters based upon um elk use and depredation um you know just just making sure that people um have elk on them um more than just sporadically um you know making sure that those people that are dealing um with elk and have elk on them are the ones that are eligible um for those permits because like i said the you know the 
those permits and the, the ability to get those permits is what's generated the support for elk um, in the state. And we want those landowners um, who actually are dealing with the elk and have depredation issues are the ones that are eligible for the permits. So um, in that, it, it's not that we're ever trying to keep landowners from getting permits. It's we're actually in that regard, sticking up for those landowners um, who are actually dealing with elk and making sure that, you know, that that the the people that are in the landowner pool and that drawing are the ones that actually have elk and not somebody who had you know one elk run across them once type of thing so so is there is there any way for these landowners to be allocated a certain amount of permits ensuring they deal them out on a fair price three hundred dollars two hundred dollars whatever the permit is and uh let ensure they handle what needs to be taken off their land? Um, no, we don't, none of our permits in the state are transferable. Um, and so, and they still have that ability to, you know, with the, the permit pool that we have to, um, to, to, to manage the access um, to, to get the harvest that they need. So, um, Clint asks, also seems like there's a real battle between growing trophy bulls and managing healthy herds that landowners will tolerate. Um, I see this with antelope as well. Yep, it definitely is. Um, and, and some of that you, you get one, and some of that's between landowners. A lot of our landowners like trophy bulls um, as well. And so it's it's trying to find that balance in all of it, you know, working with our landowners as well as the hunters and uh, general public and all that. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, a battle. Um, in that trying to find that line and figuring out, you know, there's some areas that are, um, there may be with, you know, reducing some of our herds that we may have a little lower um, bull quality. Um, but in time, you know, I think the, you know, there, there is a definitely a desire to have um, decent elk within the state. So, um, that, and that'll remain one of our, one of the parameters that we always look at um, when we're evaluating our seasons. Um, Steve, what is the chance for a hunter who has harvested a cow elk but tested positive um, for CWD to get that permit uh, reissued? Um, Alicia, do you want to handle that one? Uh, well, I think we only had one that ended up CWD positive. So, man, it's yeah. like winning the lottery, only not. Um, yeah. But we we haven't reissued permits for deer. Um, and so I... I don't believe that that would be something we would do for elk either, but that would be something, you know, we'd have to bring up and have a discussion with our director about. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the hard thing there is these, the elk permits are such high demand um, that giving somebody another chance to go hunting. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. And, you know, ultimately it's not a, there's, there's no guarantee on the, the, the meat side of it. Um, let's see. Jonathan says, appreciate all you do for big game managed across the state, Luke. Full support for statewide harvest opportunity proposed to poach to Unit 14. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> John says, nothing wrong with 60, and I'm a nine-point guy. Yeah, wasn't implying that, but, you know, if we if there was a preference point system, every one of our elk hunters would be 60 or older by, by the time they drew permits. Um, so, and some of us may be 60 even with the bonus point system. So we'll see. Um, uh, Ethan, just an opinion here, but it might be a good idea to inform people with the highlighted asterisk on the applications for areas 8 to 14 and let them know. This areas have very low elk density with limited public access. I see frustrated people every year and this unit change will compound that problem in my opinion. Yep, I, I agree with that, Ethan. Um, I'm already working uh, in my head on how to uh, write up um, in our, our big game guide, how to outline um, descriptions of some of those permits and, and or some of those units and, and those things. And I think we also um, probably in the big game guide and elsewhere need to highlight that most of our elk harvest uh, is on private land and that, you know, that there are access um, issues for that permit. Um, yeah, and just make that clear. But definitely that's, that's something that, uh, yeah, already... Haven't put it to paper, but definitely been thinking about it. Um, let's see. I think we've caught up on questions. I don't know if anybody else has any other 
um, questions on it. Um, I know I've gotten a few questions on some of the boundaries. Um, we will, uh, um, there's a few adjustments that we'll be, be looking at, um, like the, the breaks along where the map, the, the map that we have published has the unit, um, that North Platte River unit going along Highway 26. Um, one of the things we're looking at is expanding that up to encompass the the breaks north of the highway and, and following essentially the county roads um, up in the, the crop fields just north of the breaks there um, between the breaks and the sand hills just to encompass. We know that there's some elk crossing the highway there, um, you know, from Angora down to, you know, Llewellyn somewhere in there. Um, the other area we're kind of looking at to encompass a little, making it a little wider um, is that little uh, dog leg part of that unit eight um, up in that very northeast corner to encompass. There's some crop fields that are on the south side of the river. Our initial map had just followed the river. Um, I think we were probably going to move that a little bit farther south to encompass a little more of that um, and just give a little more of a buffer between the sand hills, um, just so we can try to separate you know those the sand hills proper. Um, habitat from that peripheral, you know, stuff that's got more ag in it to help us manage some of those areas and, and, and deal with some of those issues that come up and have come up already in the past. Um, but yeah, we've taken a handful of comments on some of those boundaries um, already. Um, but again, you know, the, the, the big point of it all is to try to um, separate those traditional elk areas from the, the peripheral areas so that we've got an existing pool of hunters in those peripheral areas that are ready to hunt elk and know that they're going to be hunting elk in areas that may be a little more difficult. Um, again, when somebody's, you know, in, in the past, when they've drawn a, you know, whether it's a one harvest in a lifetime or, a, you know, a, a one in 15 odds cow permit, um, you know, hunters have tended to want to hunt, you know, where the, in that traditional habitat and, and not try to chase them in a, a, corn silk jungle under a pivot um you know and so that's that's part of it is just you know trying to allow us to to be able to put you know um the appropriate amount of harvest pressure in in some of these areas to manage uh manage our elk how we how we want to and need to so that's the i to, to boil you know this whole proposal down um that's that's essentially what it is is just to help us um manage our elk better um and get the get the right harvest um instead of because the, the one thing too is you know our, our only option in the past is if we you know say take the box elder for instance you know if we've needed to increase harvest um you know in keith county it's meant throwing a lot more permits into the box elder as a whole and we really don't have any control over where that harvest is going or where those hunters are going and this this will give us more control obviously there's always going to be pockets here and there um we can't tell every hunter to go hunt this private property um or whatnot but this will at least be able to help us to uh, separate some of those areas, you know, those peripheral areas where we might need harvest from the, the core area, um, where we may or may not, um, need additional harvest. So. So, so my question, you just mentioned chasing an elk in the, in the middle of a cornfield or your corn silk harvest, what's the odds of a former rancher letting you go out in the middle of his cornfield to hunt an elk? Uh, in the past, we've had fairly good success. You know, they, th those landowners, when they're dealing with elk and in, in corn, you know, the, they, they've been really pretty good about allowing access, um, whether it's, you know, whether it's been in, you know, they're, they're in Keith County or, you know, farther out west, most of those landowners have been great to work with um, in those situations. They, they know that the elk living, um, in there for another week is going to do more damage than a than a hunter going you know knocking one down and having to pack one out so um yeah they th those landowners that have those row crop areas have been really pretty good to work with so let's see steve says the permit uh reissue question is twofold one a diseased animal was removed from the herd and two there was only three animals uh, the test is positive during the early season 2021. Um, would reissuing the permit take away from the regular permit issuing system? Um, yeah, I. The, the hard thing is, is those permits, by the time we get results back, a lot of those, you know, the seasons are um, either over or close to being over. Um, and so it would have to roll over into another year. And a, a lot of it for, you know, 
us in, in most years obviously right now we're in a a, a herd reduction kind of herd reduction mode i would say we're trying to reduce elk numbers um but by and large you know over the history of elk we've tried to be pretty conservative about our harvest and so you know a reissue of a permit would uh you know essentially to either take away the opportunity for somebody the next year um or would increase the harvest you know in that regard so it's um it could create issues there um mike is there a way that unused cow or bull permits could be used later in the season uh for example month of january just for cow elk uh continue to help with depredation issues um yeah i mean there's always a a chance and and right now well yeah i mean that's something we could always consider you know is you know setting something up where you know january is just everybody gets to come back and hunt um but yeah i mean if if that's if that's something we need what we've found though um so far is that most of our our early season success rates have been really quite high i mean we're seeing over um you know generally around 50 percent success on our cow permits which compared to most cow hunts across the west is exceptional um so yeah i mean it's something yeah if it yeah it's something we could could consider um depending on our needs um matt says in the past there's been uh here save up proposals allow landowners to transfer tags even to non even to non-residents potentially as a way to generate revenue for landowners please don't let this happen i will become a bidding war and open pandora's box resulting in tags going to highest bidders um which yeah um and and some of the issues with the transferable permits is that it doesn't necessarily solve the issue of needing fewer elk um ultimately because when you're selling a you know a, a bull permit they're going to want um or you're going to want to um create an environment where you've got a a good chance for them to kill a a bull that warrants the the money that they want to kill and um which ultimately is going to remove cow hunters off the landscape and so um yeah no thanks for the comment there matt that's kind of the end of the questions that we've got so far um if anybody's else else got anything that they want to ask please chime in um but yeah we'll give it a little while longer oh, go ahead alicia yeah i don't know luke if you wanted to touch <laughs> it's a little early but um we have the new permit system and um, if anybody's a landowner, it's never too early <laughs> to start going in and yeah. looking at your profile and the ways that you can enter your land in. I'm just trying to kind of, I know there'll be lots of other opportunities to talk about this throughout the year, but hey, well, we got some folks on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got 47 people here so we can help spread the news. Um, we do have, if, if, if you haven't seen our system, we've got a, a, a new permit. Um, system um that that's come online here been online for a little while um it's pretty easy to the first time you log in um it helps you transfer you know all your information from your previous uh your profile within the previous system over to the new system um it's been pretty seamless it's pretty simple um there's always a few hiccups because everything's you know it's different than the previous one we've all gotten used to the old one um but there were issues with the old one that uh we don't need to hash out now but the just it, it you know technology ages and it doesn't run as well as it used to so it was time for us to move on um so on on the landowner side of it um so one of the the drawbacks is that with the new system um we're asking landowners to re-enter all of their um land back into the system um it is a step it's help it'll help us to manage um all that better the the cool thing is we've integrated some gis um so you'll be able to go in and and it, it's got a map and everything where you can zoom in we're pulling data essentially that's coming through a third party that gets it from the county assessor web pages where you can click on it um and it'll bring it up or you can enter your parcel id number and it will pull that the information up and import it into your um system um so 
the the real trick of it though is the our permits are based upon the qualifying landowner that landowner that either owns the land or is um named the qualifying landowner if it's you know through a llc or a, a trust or something like that they can name one person as the qualifying landowner then that qualifying landowner can actually name um through the the family relationships you know who his qualifying or their qualifying or immediate family is um those people that would be eligible to buy um permits you know buy landowner permits um on that land you know based upon that land um but yeah it's a it's a pretty slick system um where you can go in and add those um it will take it it won't take a lot of time um but yeah the, like alicia said the earlier you can do it the better um it'll save you time um down the road it'll actually um we're hoping that this whole system will particularly with elk will speed it up um because it will it will do all those checks um essentially for us and we don't have to have the um right now every landowner elk application that comes in our staff has to verify and check um with and it takes an immense amount of time um during that that time period uh or during that application period so this um should save a lot of time um both on the landowner and our end um uh when it when it all uh gets running smoothly um obviously this this first year there'll always be a few hiccups where something doesn't work quite as planned but um the end goal and the the outline we have for it um the framework we have for it i think will be i think everybody will really appreciate it when it's all said and done so um, we had a few more added into the chat if you want to take a all right uh clint uh thank you really appreciate the chance to be involved with the meeting these things help everyone with being informed on what's going on for a reason for rule changes yeah um yeah thanks for joining thanks for the questions clint um yeah every bit of input um we get helps us out helps us understand what people are thinking or areas where there's information that is lacking out there that we need to share and um yeah in this information age there's always more that we could we could share and some of it's just trying to boil down what the those important things that we do need to be sharing um out there so yeah it's it's definitely been a this is a huge help for us um ronald says elk do a tremendous amount of damage to corn and fences uh an eight-year guy my son drew it four years and i have elk on my land um yeah and that's that's the hard thing in in trying to be responsive to our to our landowners and uh listen to them and, and try to have the the number of elk on the landscape that our um that our landowners are willing to tolerate because if once we exceed that like we've seen in the last few years um you know our, our landowners in the, the state have been been great i mean you know they for a long time they've put up with with elk um and tolerated elk and elk finally got to a point where it's like hey enough is enough and we had to do something about it and we've um you know here over the last about four years we've essentially tripled the number of cow permits trying to reduce our elk population so um you know that our yeah our landowners have have, have done a lot to to work with elk um here over these you know well the the 35 to 40 years um or more depending on what part of the state you're in but where we've had elk so um yeah landowners are a huge part in in, in dealing with elk and having elk um within the state uh, Steve says, I like the new system of setting up the hunting areas. We'll be interesting to see what the number of permits that we assigned um, to each unit. Yep. And we'll, like I said, um, those, I, I don't see a huge fluctuation in those traditional areas. We'll have, the, the bull permit should stay relatively steady. Um, there might be a few changes, you know, slight up or down. The cow permits may be, a, you know, a few fluctuations there with, a you know, um, more permits going into some of these, the the peripheral areas um overall i anticipate probably an, an, an overall increase in ill permits um for this coming year but yeah we haven't uh had all of those uh discussions just yet so uh ron <laughs> you guys have a tough job making everyone happy uh good job thanks for the meeting yep that's the that's a part of it is you know we know that we're not going to make everyone happy but we're you know really we're trying our best trying to uh incorporate a lot of um a lot of different opinions on it all and listening to uh, a lot of different people um in all of it so yep but yeah thanks for thanks for joining us ronald thanks for the questions um steve says when will you uh know when you need to issue any depredation permits um 
I that that's kind of an ongoing question that pops up. It that's a case by case basis, I guess. Um, you know, and, and some of those, whether it's a special depredation season, you know, those take a, a generally take a little longer. Um, you know, to work with landowners and say, hey, do, is this something we want to do? Whereas a, you know, the damage control permit, where it's just the you know essentially the kill permit that a, we're, we're issuing to a landowner, those can pop up and be issued rather quickly. Um, it just depends on the situation um, that's going on and the, the the damage that's occurring and how wide of an area. So, but those are all those are all tools that help us you know work with landowners to to deal with elk. Um, and and we're not we're not unique in using those. Those are common tools across the West and um, states that deal with elk um, and deer. I mean, those the eastern states. Every state that's that's got deer uses uses those types of types of permits. Um, Vay's asking, is there a reason why application dates open so late? Why can't we open earlier in the year? But more importantly, uh, have the results be earlier than July. The big reason is that. So we're kind of on a timeline regulatory wise. Um, so our seasons finish um, here. We've got elk seasons and pronghorn season and deer season with the river antlers that goes to January 31st. Uh, we've got to analyze data, have discussions about it, um, and try to set those seasons based upon set our seasons and uh, based upon that. Um, so at, at our uh, to give us time to have those discussions, to talk with people, to talk with commissioners, to educate everybody upon, you know, about the, the discussions for, for next year, um, based upon this past year's data, um, our commission meeting occurs generally about April 20th, uh, that, that all of this is approved at. Um, those orders that are uh, voted on at that meeting don't go into effect until 15 days after that. So generally it's about May, between May 5th and May 10th when those are actually into effect. Um, and so our application period occurs in June and then you know, those, the, the drawing happens about the 1st of July um, each year. And then you know, the permits go on sale essentially, or the, the elk permits go on sale. So it's, it's essentially, so the, our, our drawing to answer your question much simpler, our drawing happens late so that we can actually use last year's data in making the decision for next year's permits. Um, we're pretty crunched as it is. We basically have to have all of our information in by about the middle of March um, so that it can go through the, we can meet the regulatory deadlines. So we've essentially got, you know, obviously we're starting to make some of those judgments looking and, and drawing some of those conclusions, um, but we basically have the months of February and the first part of March to, um, go through all that information. So we're, we're pretty well crunched on time, but it's, it's a, simply a time thing. Um, Ethan asks if LB 456 were to pass, what are the game parks roll? Um, I have no idea. And I, maybe Alicia wants to chime in on that. I'll help you out on this one. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've read LB 456 and uh, from what I understand from the way it's being proposed, uh, they want the game and parks to pay for the damages and they have not, as far as I know, um, allotted for more money out of general fund or anything else. So the thought would be it would likely have to come from, you know, our our game fund license dollars. And as far as our role in the damage payments, it would appear that, you know, um, the agency or someone from the agency would have a role in deciding, you know, if that damage was, was really there or not. But there'll be a lot more information coming on LB 456 and our agency will be asked to put a fiscal note together. Um, and that'll be a part of the, the hearing process and a part of, of our role in talking about this. And, and we still need to have some conversations with our commissioners um, about these bills. And so, you know, at this point, our agency doesn't have a, a stance on it, um, but that from what I've read, um, on that legislative bill, I think there the money would come from within the game and parks at this point. I don't know if that helps answer that one. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. Yeah, uh, 
they says it'd be awesome to have the results by May, but I understand. Yeah, and we we'd like to obviously we'd like to be earlier as well. Um, but for us to, to for us to use last year's uh, data, it, it it puts us in a time crunch. We we used to um, have our season setting meeting in March, um, but we basically had to have everything finalized by February first. Um, so yeah, it's that that was a really really difficult for us to to meet those deadlines, um, if especially since we want to use our our the data from our previous season. Um, some of the states across the West um, work on three year cycles. So they set their permits for three years and then they you know evaluate um, later. Um, it's yeah, it's a blessing and a curse to have the flexibility that we have. Um, so it, it just yeah. There's there's different demands. There's there's pluses and minuses operating both ways. So um yeah, I'm trying to think. Alicia, do you have any other ideas for me to wander around talking about while people think of questions? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like a lot of the comments we've had have not necessarily been about the new um, the new setup. So I guess maybe that's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, John, I, go ahead. I, I'm seeing that. Uh, I mean, I think you're going to achieve what you're after as far as just kind of pushing some hunters over into those those other areas um, where you might not have the heaviest concentration of elk, and and I think it's. I don't know. I, I'm glad I sat in on the meeting. It's pretty informational, I thought, and I I understand what you're trying to do, and I I I think you're probably going to achieve that with with what I've seen and heard. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah, and that's you know this it's been it's one of the, it's been an issue that's kind of been it, it's not been boiling, but it's been under the surface that we've been trying to figure out how to um, solve for a little while because you know the the, the map that I showed of our harvest, um, where we did have, you know, there, there's a lot of dots over there in um, Keith and Perkins County, um, where a lot of our staff have put a lot of effort into getting hunters, pushing hunters over there, lining up access and doing all that. And it was just, a, it was an immense amount of effort to get, I think, the three previous seasons, you know, 19 to 21, we had killed um, 17 elk, I think it was, over in that area. Um, you know, but it was a lot of time with our staff. And so some of it was just trying to redistribute um, that pressure just naturally without taking a lot of um, effort and time from our staff. I mean, they've, they've got so many other things to focus on rather than, um, you know, than, than doing that uh, all the time. Um, so, yeah, it was it was just kind of the natural culmination of all that. So hopefully we're, we're hoping it works. And if, if there's things. Like I said, that in you know, I kind of mentioned it, you know, with with Vay's question, we we've got a fair amount of flexibility with um, some of our system, the way our seasons are set and things like that. Um, so if there's things that uh, we find that we're not accomplishing some of our goals, we can we can tweak some of these things and hopefully to you know if if some of our um, goals aren't achieved, you know. We, you know, we, we've got the, the possibility of making some changes, whether, you know, it, it could be even boundaries in time. These, these boundaries that we've got proposed aren't necessarily set in stone. Um, but, you know, there's some fluidity there that in time we can, we can adjust and, and make changes where needed. So. Well, and I, I mean, I know landowners that have um, property that they have out there pretty much all the time, but they're not in one of those core areas. Um, that everybody's trying to get into. So even the landowners aren't able to draw tags because the landowners that are in the real core areas are the ones that are really heavily putting in, you know, so I think it'll even open it up more for landowners as yeah. well. Just it'll it'll change that landowner distribution of permits. And and really the these first few years, um, those guys in some of the peripheral units um, where there's not a lot of landowners own in it initially are probably going to have some pretty good draw odds. So, you know, that's, there, there's, there's some benefit there of, of moving to that. Um, at least for, for them initially, I'm sure in time, you know, the, those landowner zones will get expanded, but um, yeah. Uh, let's see, 
Ethan, is it worth uh, looking and dividing tags even more and making a certain percent uh, private land only tags fo further focus that pressure on problem areas? Um, yeah, and we don't get a huge, we, we really don't get very many elk killed on, on public land um, anyway uh, right now. Um, so I, I don't know that we, we necessarily need to make that public private separation um, at this point. Um, if there's an issue that pops up, you know, it's, it's possible we'd, we'd look at that. Um, we do know that in time, you know, there's some of these units like that, you know, the, what, I can't even remember what my numbers are, but like the uh, nine and 13, nine was kind of that's the Sand Hills area. And then 13 was the, you know, Eastern, um, you know, the, the less Hills, you know, all the way East. Um, we we anticipate in time there will probably be some splits in some of those areas, um, just as we learn. Oh, hey, we need to you know force some more pressure in this area or whatnot. Um, I anticipate there there will be some splitting that way, and we could, yeah, depending on what we find, we may find oh we need to um, make some unit changes and you know add one or two more or something like that or make a make another split. So yeah, I mean it's always a possibility. Um, but again, it's we we got to. Um, we got to see an issue and, and, and see if, if uh, there's needed changes to try to solve those issues. Um, so it's, yeah, something we could definitely look at there, Ethan. But hope everybody's preparing or prepared for the snowstorm we're getting. I just got to text it. I can't tell. They might have canceled school here. I'm not sure yet, but it looked like they canceled our school. <laughs> did they? I was gonna say I saw yeah. a bunch, I saw a bunch of them earlier, Hastings and a bunch of other places were canceling. So I hope everybody's stocked up and ready to at least we don't have massive wind coming with this one, but a lot of snow it looks like good moisture for the state. So all right, hey, we got a couple more questions. All right, uh, Russ, due to the heavy workload of farmers, ranchers in September and October, would you consider allowing landowners with bull tags uh, to hunt in December and January? Um, yeah, that's that's something that we could we could possibly look at. Um, we've had some discussions about some of those season dates, um, and that might be something that that's worth worth looking at. Um, the the one thing I've I do know that um, in, in looking at that and, you know, the reason that we kind of, um, I guess, in general, have said no to changing like the bull season in particular is we've had really good success, um, you know, on our, our bull permits. Um, this year was a little bit lower at 77 percent for the last five or seven years. It's hovered right around 90 percent, um, which is exceptional. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something we could look at if if we see a pattern in there and and get some interest in that. Um, uh, Bryant, will the new landowner zone application be uh, taken in the non-traditional units if there are pockets of elk that start to grow uh, into acceptable herds? Um, yeah, we'll our our landowner zone will expand. Um, you know, as our elk use uh, expands. Um. You know, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll continue to add, you know, uh, landowner zones um, and have, you know, more eligible landowner landowners for those, for those, particularly those new units um, with the expansion of elk. Um, with so the that, exception of 14. Yeah, yeah, I guess with the exception yes. of 14, because we don't really have established elk in 14, and so there's not really a... A, a need for a landowner's own there. Um, so, oh, Clint's asking why such a drop in that success rate. Um, I I don't know. And and really, I mean, it, like last year it dropped from like eighty eight percent to seventy seven percent. Um, our historic average for bull permits from day one is seventy eight percent. Um, on the bull permits, so we're at seventy seven. Our goal is we we don't want to see them drop below seventy. Um, in each of our units. Um, and so I, I, some of it's probably drought related. I think that there is some landowners limited access, driving access in particular, um, with it being so dry this last fall. So I assume, um, that's probably part 
of, of what limited our access, but really, you know, going from 88 or 86 down to 77 isn't a huge, um, isn't a huge drop and it's still within the window. Um, I mean, it's, it's still really good. You know, most, most bull permits are, you know, in, in Colorado, you know, most elk permits are a 20% success or lower, um, across a lot of those units. So, um, we're still in a, a, a pretty good spot, you know, this last year at 77%. So, but yeah, I, I I would assume it was uh, drought related. So, but. Bay says, thanks for hosting the meeting. Great information. Hey, thanks for joining us, Faye. Good questions. We appreciate it. So, but. but yeah. I guess if uh, we can hang around a few more minutes longer, if if anybody's got any questions, you can you can think of sure ask. Um, I'm trying to think if I covered everything with our new permit system, um, but there will be more information coming out um, in time. It's the you know the the big issue with our last or our previous one. Everybody remembers the crashes that happened on our opening sales dates. Um, we actually when non-resident turkey permits of course those are capped at 10,000 this year um those went on sale uh i'm going to generate more questions by bringing stuff up like turkeys and stuff um but uh when those went on sale last monday we actually sold a thousand permits in the first 10 minutes which um was a higher rate than what caused our old system to crash um in 2019 so um our new system and it didn't the they threw a lot of um, power at it and it didn't even use 10% um, of the capacity um, where we were at. So that was that was good news. It passed that first test um, as far as volume goes. So um, yeah, the, the, we're, we're excited about the new system. Obviously it's, it's different. It'll take us a little bit of time to learn it, but we're excited about it. Uh, Ethan asks, how will the quotas in the new areas outside of the traditional areas be calculated if there's not really a resident herd in the area? Um, actually, I may have misspoke. E each of those um, units, it, with the exception of 14, has resident elk in it, um, where we've got elk uh, um, living year-round or really close to year-round, um, or, or at least are there during the, uh, um, during the, the hunting season, during the fall. Um, so yeah, most of those, most of those areas have got resident elk. We'll, we'll, um, as far as setting those quotas, you know, it, it'll kind of be one of those, um, things where we're going to, we'll, we'll work with staff, our local staff to try to develop, you know, what we think we need. Um, I should say we'll work with local staff and also work with the landowners in that area to try to, um, decide what kind of hunting pressure we need and what kind of harvest, um, we need to have in those areas to, um, have the, have our intended impact. Um, and, you know, this first year, you know, obviously in time, we'll, we'll make some adjustments if we aren't getting, you know, quite the impact that we're having or if we're um, harvesting more than maybe what the, the landowners in that area would uh, like to see. So there'll be there'll be adjustments um, in coming years. But, you know, a lot of that this first year will come just from, you know, uh, local staff working with landowners and having conversations that way. So. And we, we do have a, you know, we, we've got a pretty good history, you know, just looking back at, you know, when we've started new units, looking at um, what our success and, and permit allocations are, have been, um, you know, we, we've, our, our staff's got a, a pretty good idea on, on what we want to, generally what we, what we want to do in those, those circumstances. So. Luke, do you have an update on uh, the har deer harvest uh, for this last year, um, 2022? I know that it's still ongoing, but was just wondering if you have an idea what that is and um, 
if, uh, if there is going to be any major changes or any changes to deer season since uh, you talked about turkey season. I thought I'd throw that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, so with the uh, late firearm season, um, the antelope season ending on the 15th, of course, the um, river analyst is still ongoing. Um, I'm planning on doing a download of the data um, tomorrow um, to, to get that out to staff so they can start having conversations um, to, for uh, our permit numbers for, for this upcoming year. Um, I, I anticipate we'll probably have um, some reductions. Our, our mule deer harvest, our mule deer buck harvest was definitely down. Um, I, I don't think I have it pulled up, but it was our, our mule deer buck harvest was definitely down. I anticipate a reduction in uh, mule deer buck permits. Um, in some places within the state, I anticipate some reductions in uh, analyst whitetail harvest. Um, we've seen some declines, you know, over the last few years with, you know, whether it's uh, due to the, you know, purposeful reductions of, of deer populations where we places where we had too many, we issued a lot of permits. Um, we'll probably see some um, and plus we've had some EHD in some pockets as well. So I assume that there'll be some places where we see some reductions in analyst permits or reductions in bonus tags and things like that. Um, but yeah, I guess, yeah, big picture wise. Yeah. Th those are kind of the two things I, um, yeah. And we, ha we haven't had, um, a lot of our staff. So right now, a lot of our local staff are all meeting, kind of going through each of their units and having those conversations. Um, in about two weeks, we will meet. Um, we, uh, we'll have a meeting with a, a lot of our um, our big game staff, as well as our uh, our district supervisors, our district managers, um, and have conversations about all of the the elk, antelope, and deer permits. Um, and so we, we haven't had all those conversations yet to, to know exactly what direction we're going, but I anticipate at least with, with those two uh, issues that those are, those are two things that I, I can anticipate that'll happen. But as far as the details for each of the, uh, um, for all the deer permits this coming year, those will, those, those conversations have yet to be had, but they're coming up pretty soon. So <laughs> thanks, Tim. Appreciate that. Um, John says, I think you already covered this, but when do you hope to have the new units finalized and announced? Um, so yeah, those would be finalized and voted on at our um, April commission meeting. And that's probably sometime around April 20th, uh, give or take a little bit. I don't have that calendar in front of me. Um, I, I would expect that we will probably have some sort of um, press release saying what we're proposing um well it, we we generally do have a like a real high level um press release when we're announcing our uh um proposed changes to orders in march um with all of the public input work that went into this i assume there will be a little more details on it um there and i assume that'll be sometime in march when we would do that that's generally about 45 days ahead of that april commission meeting so the orders should be on our website probably the week of March 13th would be my guess for big game orders. And then the meeting is on April 19th in Fremont. It's a Wednesday meeting. Uh -oh. And I agree you're a rock star. <laughs> oh there's my chat my chat disappeared for a bit um yeah i guess if there isn't any more questions we can probably let everybody go um or it looks like we've had about 10 people skip out already but um yeah I guess, if it, you know, we'll hang up and everybody will think of questions. If you have questions or anything, um, my email is on that elk plan page. Um, just shoot me an email. I'll respond. I've, I've responded to all 100 comments we've gotten so far. I've spent most of the last week responding to those. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. If, if you. Yeah. 
if you um, have any questions or anything that pop into your head, just feel free to email me or give me a call or anything. I'll be happy to chat with you or answer. Um, but yeah, Russ says, thanks for the meeting. Um, good, it looks like you were successful. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks to everybody. Thanks for joining us um, on here. This has been a huge help, got a lot of input. Um, both through this and through the web form. I, there's a lot of names I recognize here. I've already gotten emails and had conversations with, with several of you. Um, and a lot of a lot of names that I know through other conversations or past working history. So I'm glad to see um, everybody here. So that's been that's been great. Um, but yeah, unless there's anything else that that pops up, um, I think we'll go ahead and and call it a night. So um, again, thanks for joining us. Have a great night and stay warm. Um, get out your snow shovel, I guess. So, so we'll see you. Thanks everyone for your time.